everybody and welcome to the NBA Show Reviews. This is James Cork and with me I have Norman Sanso. What are these things on my hooves? They're strange. They are called wrinkles and they happen on old people, like you are. <laughs> <laughs> and also some brony reviewer, Silver Quill. I have been to high school. Middle age is nothing. <laughs> For those that say that ha that we haven't been to war or we don't know what suffering is, yeah, try going to high school. Good luck with that. <laughs> God damn it. Especially this high school, because today, of all movies that we may be touching upon, we're going to be talking about Equestria Girls, uh, the My Little Pony spin-off movie directed by Jason Thyssen and written by Megan McCarthy that was uh, first premiered in the Los Angeles Film Festival on June 15, 2013. Oh, wow. So, um, well, what is there to say about this movie that hasn't been said yet? I mean, it's been two years after the fact, no pun intended, and oh. it's not, uh, like... <laughs> You owe me a yeah, quarter. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I think, I think I do. I'm not allowed to say that without having to pay the owner uh, money for it. <sighs> God damn, with this copyright thingy. But yeah, um, so you know, we're gonna go across the board and we're gonna talk about this movie. We're not gonna go scene by scene. No need for that. And if you haven't watched it already, well, you know, just for the sake of it, if you haven't watched it and you're listening to this review. Go watch the movie. It's only an hour long. We can wait. Then you can come back and listen to us. So, um, guys, what did you think of this film? Uh, what What did you make of it? Well, I, I fully agree with people that this was basically... <laughs> a, you could see the dollar signs in Hasbro's corporate eyes as they realized, hey, we can market creepy-looking dolls to children and they'll buy it uh, if we slap the My Little Pony logo on it. I'm sorry to be cynical, but I really think that was the initial mode of driving this forward. True. Now, that. I will uh, well, the step that they did the best with what they had, which, you know, you have to draw humans. That's that's going to be different. Mm -hmm. You have to transition from the My Little Pony universe to the Equestria Girls universe, even more confusing. And you have to basically have a very short-lived conflict. But to be honest, this had everything working against it. And ultimately, while I consider it a harmless movie, it didn't damage anything. It didn't reduce the characters in any capacity. At the same time, I was like, you know, even if this is part of the continuity, it has no impact. Everything that happens in the human world doesn't follow Twilight into Equestria. So right there, we've lost some involvement. I talked at length in a review about how Twilight's worried about being a leader, and I still maintain that she didn't learn to be a leader in the human world. She learned popularity. And people have argued, oh, but leaders are supposed to be popular. No. Abraham Lincoln did a lot of unpopular things during his time as president. I point to him. One of them J cost him his life. Mm. What, going to the theater? Well, that, I'm sure the theater was quite popular. <laughs> JFK also made unpopular decisions. In fact, some of the best leaders we've had have not worried about being popular. They've worried about making good decisions. So I get kind of uppity when people say, we're at this point now, and this might explain potential President Donald Trump, that we <laughs> are confused, we're confusing popularity with leadership ability. Okay. Well, I guess Don't that's vote the Trump. Any... <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's the, it's the problem with every uh, leader, uh, with every leader system nowadays is that they don't... Um, they, 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 you're right. They are confusing popularity with leadership. That is never the, that is never, uh, the case. Uh, or very rarely the case. Um, but I think the reason why, why people may defend the Quest Girls in that regard, I think it's because, well, maybe they see it as a different perspective on high school. Like, yeah, is the, um, the unpopular one that ends up saving the day. It's like, what? No, no, it's not. It's, I, I always found it, Bizarre when people defend try to defend this movie from that perspective. Like, who is saying these things anyway? <laughs> Where did you see these comments? Uh, my my YouTube video request for your daily comments. Uh, mm. Well, but, and uh, regarding the regarding the continuity, I I never considered this actually to be canon at all. 
I don't know about you guys, but how can you consider canon these when they are talking about alternate universes and then they talk about this, they, they, this, this happens and then they don't bring it up into the, into the TV show. It's as oh, canon it's... as the Yu-Gi-Oh! movie is to the Yu-Gi-Oh! show. Oh, but, but then, but then they have, uh, Flash Sentry appears in Three's a Crowd <laughs> and introduces people, introduces ponies in Twilight's Kingdom. And you're like, well, he's there. Yeah. He was in the movie. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think everyone oh. would rather he just took a chill pill elsewhere. Uh, even though, okay, I'll, main, I'll maintain this and we, we'll probably talk about this more when we get to human flash century. There is nothing inherently wrong with fl- flash century in pony or human form. In fact, uh, I saw some comments, uh, on Derby Boru talking about his character. And it was an interesting point. He's, if he hadn't been fleshed out to a degree, people would have loved to ship him with Twilight because he was this tabula rasa <laughs> that they could make a, a, a personality for. But mm-hmm. as it is, the old boy has just enough to him that you're, you have a certain inflexibility in how you can present his character, but he's not fleshed out enough to really hold the audience's attention for extended period. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's a weird character in that in, in in that aspect. When you think about it, it's like he is not bland enough that I can uh, replace him with myself and put me in his place. But he's not fleshed out enough to be his own character. He's weird in that in that I have never seen a character that is so bizarrely put together. I'm pretty sure you guys can think of many examples, but I cannot think of any right now. It's 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 odd. I don't know. I mean, Flash as a character, he's pretty well. How do I put this? In a show where the female character is more prominent than the male character, Flash is just one of those characters who is just there to be the love interest for the other character, which is Twilight. And to me, he he doesn't really push the story along or drag the story down. He's just there just to be there. Not until up to the Luna scene where he comes in and saves Twilight. But besides that, Flash, if you look at it, he's kind of a awesome guy and a kind of cool friend you want to hang out with. He may be standoffish at first, but once you get to know him, he's pretty cool. Well, I think we can pursue this when we get into the... Talk about the movie proper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Feel, because I, I just noticed that the gun is over there and we are like in the stratosphere right now because we jumped the gun so high. Yeah. We, I, we, are, yeah. we are leaving the planet. I'm just waiting for my turn, James. <laughs> <laughs> take it, man. Take it. Oh, wow. No, I mean. Do it. Just do it. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. But anyway, uh, as for me, my, when, when I, I <laughs> how to put this? The movie before it came out, I did this special podcast with uh, let me see, with Alpha Brony from Bronyville, Cal Payne, Pixel Kitty, Chef Sandy from Bronyville. And we were talking about the implications of this movie coming out and what do we do. It's like basically, My Little Pony, Ghostra Girls, what should we do and is it time to panic? It's a podcast on the show, you guys should check it out. It's a while back, but we basically talk about the movie or what's this about and should we panic, should we support it, should we not support it and stuff like it was a really long time ago, but overall, once I saw this movie, I kind of am okay with it. It's not that bad. I wouldn't say this is the best movie I've seen in my life, but it's not that bad. It's kind of entertaining, and it does bring up a whole lot of questions to who or how Sunset came along and what is Celestia's deal. Well, when we go through it, we'll go through it, but I need to ask a few things when we get to them. Like, there... What's the word looking for? Mm, plot holes? Something like that? I'll, I'll Some say, ponies have those. I, all I'm saying, Norman, is that you, you sound generally ticked. Not really. It's just that, okay, um, besides the point that I've been reading a lot of fanfics, but... It's just like a whole thing of okay. I'll just this messes say, with my head, Gannon. No, no, no. It, here's the thing: How does Sunset Shimmer know where to find the crown, and how does she know the crown even exists? 
and how does she know where to look for them and and stuff and how when did Celestia have sunset and how old is sunset blah 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 you know what I mean it's just a whole lot of how what did what uh, but uh, I guess when we reach that point we'll reach that point we will reach that point when we reach that point yeah. mm-hmm. yes you have to worry about it we'll talk about it at length or not or maybe we'll just say it's a kids movie you don't need to think about it but they thought about it on the show oh gosh yeah <sighs> anyway no. so how are we going to do this you guys I didn't even say what I thought of the movie oh, oh I see I see you just want me to introduce the film and then you just talk about it okay you, fine you talk about I'm going to the corner now <laughs> you, you share your opinion like, goodbye <laughs> uh, okay what do you think about it man the way that I see this movie is oh how would I put this one it's two parts My Little Pony, one part High School Musical, one part Persona 4. What? Yeah, no, seriously, because the way that Twilight has to build the friendships with, uh, with the human main six, and social then links. they have to build up the, they have to build up their social links so they can go defeat a demon at the end of the game. It's Persona 4, okay? <laughs> it's, it, that's, that's how I, I saw the movie since it premiered in 2013, and that's how I see it nowadays. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much. I mean, I detach it completely from the My Little Pony uh, TV show. This has this has little to nothing to do with the My Little Pony show. It has no connection with any of the seasons. We only have the characters, the voice actors, and the writers just taking this, making a spin-off. And because I don't connect it with MLP at all, I think that's why I enjoy it so much. This is probably one of those movies that I kind of was obsessed with it for a while. <laughs> and like I, wa- I, pr- I pretty much watched it every day. I had like <laughs> during the entire summer of 2013, oh, wow. I watched it daily, <laughs> uh, wow. and like had it had it as a bag in the background or there in just just playing in the background, not paying attention to it, or sometimes paying attention to it. Wow. But I think it's um, I think I think the reason why I watch this movie so much is the same reason why I watched the Star Trek Into Darkness so much, <laughs> uh, because uh, both movies. They are like a train wreck in a clown circus. <laughs> oh, wow. They are they, they are terrible, they are a mess, and they are not really good, but it's so entertaining to watch, and it's so fun that I can just switch off my brain and just watch it. People were saying, oh, Michael Bay is the perfect director for switch off your brain and watch the movie. Nah, that's not true. That is not true at all. This movie, though, is the perfect switch off your brain and just watch it, because it doesn't require a lot of thinking to enjoy. So wait, James, you're telling me that Twilight is Kenpachi Ramasama? <laughs> I, lo- I love you, Kenpachi Ramasama. <laughs> Yay! Kenpachi Ramasama, how can you be so flippant? It's so desirable. <laughs> uh, with Nanako the narc face. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, where do we start? Where do we start? Teams or scenes? We uh, start on the Crystal Empire. Oh, right. uh, oh, synonymous with disappointment. <laughs> yeah, it's. It, um, it, I I will agree. It's not the best way to start. No, I agree with you, Silver. But go ahead. Go go ahead. Say say what you were gonna say. Well, I just the the Crystal Empire has become synonymous with underutilization. <laughs> I mean, I may have already said this in a previous podcast, but I'm gonna I'm gonna rehash this. Everything in the Crystal Empire could be great. This mystical land of magic and and mystery. This Lost for a thousand years, so many new venues for for entertainment. How many times have we visited this place? Three? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, let's see. We have on the season three premiere, Games Ponies Play, the, the Crystal Games. We saw the, we saw it briefly with the crossover episode with Just for Sidekicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we saw it at the, at the end of season five. No, at the end of, at the end of season four, I mean, season five hasn't even ended yet. What am I talking about? Season four, and yeah, at the end of season four, and, uh, yeah, Pinkie Pie was there for a brief moment in, uh, Party Poop. There's the other distinction. We go there as tourists for all of five minutes, tops. Uh, th- this place can't carry an episode for the life of it. I don't think that's it, because, uh, my point of view is the writers are not utilizing this place well, because from what I'm looking at the pictures here, it has a lot of stories to tell, like the library, the scenes, everything is there for the pickings. Just the writers are not utilizing it really well. 
Yeah, but if you notice, even in most recent episodes, in the uh, Princess Spike episode, they keep using Canterlot, which is a location that has been used since season one. Um, I think the problem with the Crystal Empire is that uh, because of Hasbro's... No, it's not that it's too far. I mean, from a, from a practical point of view, Hasbro wanted them to promote the crystal toys and all that, and, you know, the, the ponies that were made out of, that, that they were translucent, and they didn't fully flesh the Crystal Empire beyond the season premiere, and because season 3 had only 13 episodes, I'm pretty sure if season 3 had had more than 13 episodes, they could have put up a few more uh, stories that took place in the Crystal Empire, perhaps fleshed out the story with, with uh, Twilight Princess uh, a lot better, give her a bit more exposure. So... Yeah, you know what? Whenever whenever somebody says the Crystal Empire is completely trashed and unused, I am like, I agree. I I like the place, I like the season three premiere, but I agree, it's so underutilized. It's it's insulting. And the same can be said for its rulers, two very interesting characters with a lot of potential that has been, in my eyes, going underutilized. Flash Sentry, he's living there now for reasons. Mm -hmm. He could be a really interesting character but is not being utilized. It's all there. There's all these, po- all the crystal ponies. We, we know of the librarian, but that's it. Even in the crystal pony, co- even in the comics, most of the crystal ponies are just ponified versions of TV personalities. Mm-hmm. There's so much that could be there, but they don't, either they can't or don't want to do anything with it. Or maybe they are not allowed. Yeah, I think it could be one of Hasbro's mandate thingies where uh, we want to focus more on certain things and to to push certain products. So this could be one of them. And the Crystal Empire, well, we'll see because we still have uh, half a season left and a season six to cover. So we'll see if they do more with it. I shall not hold Ah. my breath. Yeah, true that. Well, you know that the, the the seasons will keep rolling as Hasbro's marketing keep chugging out ideas. Mm-hmm. Like you just said something at the beginning of the of the uh, review, Silver, about how you were very cynical by saying, "Oh, this is Hasbro's new product; they are going to promote it, and that's what they need." No, it's, that is not cynical. That is realistic. That is being that, that that is you giving an opinion that is grounded in reality because you are correct. I mean, Hasbro is not going to use the Crystal Empire unless they have something related with it that they can market. So if they have no purpose or they have no use to make money out of it, they will not make something out of it. But then again, this is the company that dumped a, a lot of money into making a movie based on the board game Battleship <laughs> and uh, chucked four Transformer movies made by Michael Bay. Yes, they are marketing people, they are businessmen, but sometimes they are not very good ones. Maybe that's why they don't want to use the Crystal Empire anymore. They are afraid of another fluke. They are they are fear so, fearful of that. I guess so, but anyway, so oh, well. we are at the Crystal Empire, and what's happened next? Like, the pony all get around? Yeah, they they are there to a summit, princess summit of some sort. There are four princesses, why can't they just get together for a poker night? <laughs> Maybe they were waiting on the other Disney princesses to arrive, but the train crashed or something? I just find it funny that you, apparently, Equestria is more like a collection of kingdoms uh, guarded by Celestia and Luna. It'd be hilarious if there were all these princesses walking in the background. It's like, you thought Princess Twilight was upsetting? Have a look at this, and this, and this, and this. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, man, I actually kind of wish I could have seen that now. Oh, wow. <laughs> Here's the thing about Equestria Girls. Leading up to this, this was right on the heels of Princess Twilight. And yeah. people were throwing fits on the internet left and right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Every time I thought, okay, it's finally dying down. People are calming we're going back to Tranquilo. Oh, here's an Equestria Girls <laughs> announcement. Rah! And then it started up <laughs> all over again. Equestria Girls was like a rash that kept coming up and, and irritating the whole fandom. So by oh. the time this movie finally came out, it was like, just get it done. Just put it out there and let's put this behind us. Yeah, but you know, the, the thing about this movie is that when it came out, or oh, when it was going to come out, it was supposed to have a direct-to-DVD sales. There's no movie or anything like that. It's just there so that they can sell the dolls because they were competing with Mattel, with Barbie and Monster High. But Mm -hmm. somehow the fans wanted this to go on theaters. 
And I heard a lot of bronies from Dusty Cat to podcast hosts saying that they went to the theaters to watch. Even going to theaters where they were sold out, like a whole family, like literally a whole family, like mother and dad with daughters wanted to watch the movie. The tickets were sold out. <laughs> so that was that. So this movie was kind of out of nowhere. And for it to be in the film festival, that was even wow. You know what? I think uh, when the movie first came out, they kind of made a few numbers here and there. Mm -hmm. If you compare the amount of money that they made combined DVD, uh, DVD sales, Blu-ray sales, and the money they made on the theater with how much money they put on to make in the, the movie mm -hmm. um, and the rating that it got on Rotten Tomatoes, okay. we could say that this is the, this is the, the highest grossing, highest rated Hasbro movie based on one of their toy products ever produced. With uh, how many percent uh, money on return? I think it. Ha I I think in in I don't know how much it got it got back, but uh, on Rotten Tomatoes it has like a sixty three sixty five percent. That's not bad. Which, uh, you, dude, that is like six times more than what Pixels got. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's. I know. Okay, but comparison and all that because it's Pixels. But think about that for a moment. Is that uh, a movie that went into theaters that had millions and millions behind it that was directed by by one of the best directors uh, of all time, Christopher Columbus? It has the w w a lowest rating than Equestria Girls. Think about that for a moment. Well, I don't know what to say about that, but to me, when you have a sixty percent on Rotten Tomatoes for a movie that was well essentially to sell toys. This is not bad. That, that means... I think that's that, a kind of a miracle. Yeah, true that. But that means that this movie was... How do I put this? They, they, they put in a lot of effort into it. Because... How do I put this? You, we have the original cast coming back. We have the original team that created the cartoons. Oh, and coming back. The, it's yeah, not I mean, like they left from... Uh, okay, yeah, I, know I know what but, you mean. But, but still, like the, the thing is, this movie was what fans wanted. It was an extension of the show, but what fans didn't want was the human aspect of this. So, uh, no, you are wrong. You are really? wrong. No, nobody. Wants I am it. going to no. I'm going to correct you right now. One of the first pieces of fan art that came out on the internet when My Little Pony became popular was humanization of the main six, and Hasbro because they have the guy, uh, the guy with the charts. Saying, okay, the chart says that the fans like to have humanized characters, uh, stories that are related to, and because of all the fans that we are uh, making this uh, study based on, they are teenagers, so they have to be uh, taking place in high school. And uh, yeah, we're going to market it like this. And oh, what is our primary market that we don't we we are failing against? Oh, uh, the monster high dolls. We're gonna make a Crusher Girl dolls. Yeah, they're gonna be humans. Okay, let's go do this. Oh, that's wow. that's basically it. Um, Andy Price was asked this on the I think it was at San Diego Comic Con 2014, and when somebody asked him something related to Equestria Girls, he said, "That movie is your fault, guys, because <laughs> Hasbro was looking at fan art and they saw all the humanized <laughs> ponies that you guys were doing, so they decided to make it humans because it's what you guys seem to like, and then you guys <laughs> go and hate it." You... Uh... Well, that's I think that's because fandoms, you know. When you put an idea out in a fandom, it's part of the fandom. No one expects it to really become official or influence fandom. the show. Mm -hmm. So when they start thinking this, you're like, guys, we're the fans. We write crappy fanfics. But, Silver, with you there, Adventure Time had a gender swap character, like Finn the human, that's Fiona the human. And that started off because of the fandoms, and the show creator just ran with it. So I've not, I've not watched Adventure Time. I am not qualified to comment. Yeah, but, but uh, that was pretty good. So you, we had that. And I don't know, it's kind of a hit and miss when it comes to show creators taking something from the fandom or being influenced by the fandom. But, but also, Sonic but fandom! I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> but also, ask yourself, the humans that fans drew of uh, Pony Versions, they were proportional for the most part. Mm-hmm. Had some meat on their bones, <laughs> and didn't and didn't look like they'd fall over. They are breaking half in a strong wind. 
Uh, so, you tell me about it. You tell me about it. I hate the the Christy girl's proportions. You know that, Silver. <laughs> well, uh, so, so here, I could accept the idea that, yeah, we may have brought this on ourselves unintentionally. Fair enough. But I think the fans put in more effort to designing. And if there is a danger in letting the fandom dictate content because fans don't always know what they want. Mm, true. Of we, course we, they aren't. We do write. Aren't. We do write bad, bad fanfics. We do have bad ideas. Mm, true. Have true. you checked my Debian art? It's oh, full of God. bad ideas. Oh, God. <laughs> it is something that is worthy of discussion. It's like the motivation behind Hasbro making this movie and why they're making that. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I will mention something later. If the Crystal Empire comes back into uh, mm-hmm. into conversation, but let's keep moving forward because yeah. then we have one of the coolest moment of, moments of the entire movie. Uh, it's the I know it's stupid to say this, but it's the intro. I really like that animation that they made. The intro for this one reminds me of Alex S's uh, My Little Pony opening team remix. I don't know why, but it just does. It's fun. It's lighthearted. It's energetic, mm-hmm. and the visuals. I mean, just. Seeing the characters' silhouettes doing their daily thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is enjoyable. But that, and then, of course, people have said, "Well, they spoiled the movie by having this." It's like, guys, that's not that's not even a Shyamalan twist. Yeah, that's on the, that's on the poster. <laughs> yeah, that's the movie, true. The movie is called Equestria Girls. What yeah. more? Nah. <laughs> well, what they what they didn't spoil was the appearance of Flash. Oh, Johnny. Hooray. I was kind of glad. To, I was kind of glad that they um they they did give credit properly to the to the voice actors. I mean, how many other movies, animated movies, start giving you the names of the of the voice actor, uh, actors and actresses that are uh, are going to have are going to perform these characters? I think this is one of the few. I'm trying to think of other movies that have done something like that, but I cannot think of any for the love of me. Not even Disney fo- uh, films do that. Not even DreamWorks movies with their celebrity stuck, uh, struck casts uh, uh, do that. I don't remember. Probably there are, but we need to... Well, uh, probably we need to double check. But continue on with this movie. Uh, the princesses meet, they talk, and Twilight is sent to bed. Oy. I know Celestia is the mother figure of Equestria, but it's hard to call Twilight amongst peers when she's getting sent to bed. All she needs is to ask Celestia to read her a bedtime story. <laughs> this one bothers me a bit in terms of why are you even there, Twilight? Like, I, I know that we don't really need to bother the viewers with an additional plotline to the Princess Summit. We don't really need to focus that, but we really want your focus to be more on the Equestria Girls team thingy. But this is just downplaying Twilight's role. Uh, it's a teenager. She's a teenager. She's been sent to bed because in a couple of minutes she's going to turn into a prepubescent teenager. This also bothers me in terms of how old is Twilight? Yeah, because in the show that in the show they could be like in their thirties, maybe I'd say perhaps 20s, older. Twenties, twenties to higher because well, between twenties to thirties, I I think Applejack will be well over her thirties. I mean, come on, nah, business she's, man. She's younger, like. Probably around her mid-twenties. She's just hardened because of all the things that she went through. Here's my thing. In some ways, the age isn't as important as the titles. I don't know. That sounds strange. Have I ever mentioned Carl Jung before? I think I have. Carl Jung. Yeah, huh? Jung. Yeah, yeah. You have mentioned him uh, him a couple of times. Well, I I stick to it, and I really should just make a video about this (laughs) because I harp on it so much. Some people believe that archetypes meant to reflect stages of development. Celestia was originally meant to be Queen Celestia. Hasbro put the kibosh on that because Princess sells that. Yeah. She would have been Queen Celestia. And the Queen is the mother figure, the archetype, the leader. It's not every little girl wants to be a princess. It's that every princess is supposed to represent little girls. Twilight, as a princess, could be young, learning the ropes. But by making everyone a princess equal title, you're implying that they are of equal status. And they're not. Celeste is the ruler. There's no question of that. She is the ultimate authority in this land. I wish they'd own that. I'm kind of sorry they didn't name her queen, just to remove any ambiguity here. The whole fact that Disney put the whole stigma of queens being evil characters was kind of their fault, but I, I think they're progressing now. Disney is fixing that right now. Look at Frozen. Yeah, but just just one movie, so we need to see what they come up next. 
No, but it, it's a, it's a very forward move for Disney that is such a conservative uh, uh, institution that now they are even willing to take that that step forward and say, yeah, no, we're not going to do the the evil queen evil uh, thing anymore. So in this regard, Hasbro feels like the 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 kid that is late to the party. And he arrives talking, uh, like making 80s references and quoting 90s memes. <laughs> oh, we'll so it's like, ah, oh, guys, did you hear the, about Trogdor? He's so cool. Trogdor! Uh, and you're like, James, oh, God. We'll, this we'll is soon so cool. do that. We'll soon, we'll soon do the same thing too, man. We'll soon do people the same are already thing. Do, people are already doing that. Look at what happened with the Rickroll. I mean, come uh, on. God, no, no it, it, that's how sometimes it feels like with Hasbro is that they are getting late to the, they're getting late to the party. They're getting late to the, to the celebration. Yeah. But I'm going to s- jump ahead a few scenes and introduce Sunset. Yay. Sunset comes in, steal the crown. Steal the crown. And here's the thing. I'm just going to say this about Sunset for the whole movie because really it's summed up with this. She's your stereotypical mean girl, mm-hmm. but everything fascinating about her is how she redefines the other characters. For Twilight, she is a foil. She she is what Twilight could be in a way, in a sense, if she were a little less noble, a little less generous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She's the dark. She's the dark part of the princess archetype. For Celestia, Sunset Shimmer is is proof that Celestia is imperfect. She made a bad call on a student. She either failed Sunset or Sunset was just not a good choice to begin with. Now, Celestia says, oh, I tried to help her. But you're like, Celestia, your track record is not looking so good. Your sister, Phil, it's like Twilight's like third time this is the charm. So far, we Celestia's one for three in terms of helping out here. Here's something interesting that I noticed where, okay, uh, in the IDW My Little Pony comic annual, they kind of introduce or kind of explain certain aspects of Sunset Shimmer, like how she was. And technically, she was an overachiever, like Twilight. She was good at magic. But the only difference is that she kind of pushed her a bit too late in terms of finding friends and getting to know people. And Sunset Shimmer was kind of really ambitious. See, the thing is, I, I read that comic as well, but I felt like Sunset was just as she was in the movie. There was nothing to really flesh out why why she was so hard on herself, why she was so driven. It's just mean for mean's sake. And people might argue, well, there are people in life who are just that way and you never know why. True. But in a fictional world, in a scripted universe, there is a desire to know, to flesh out that character, to explore the reasons. And we haven't gotten that. I will say I like Sunset Shimmer a lot more in Rainbow Rocks and probably in Friendship Games. Sunset here, like in the first movie, she's just your typical mean girl. Like even with the edition of the comics, we still don't understand her motivation besides her need for power. That's about it. Like she's evil just to be evil's sake. Like she's Vegeta. And (laughs) why? Like she... (laughs) <laughs> why is she that way? Like, why? Because she wants to be powerful. She wants to take over the world, of course. Well, there's a scene in Rainbow Rocks that kind of hints at what was happening there. It's only a hint, but it's a very good one. It's like a, when we talk about Rainbow Rocks, I will sing that scene's praises. James, what are your thoughts, man? You know, I cannot hate her. I completely understand why she is not a completely flawless character. I mean, yeah, you guys are right. Even her character arc is very rushed. The ending of Equestria Girls, hell, I will say the ending of uh, the two Equestria Girls movies that we have, they suffer from magical mystery cure syndrome. <laughs> in that, and I will be all, almost as far as calling it M.A. Larson syndrome, because every single M.A. Larson episode has this. Every single episode, from the very beginning of the show, every single episode written by M.A. Larson has the whole thing about, we're going to have this fantastic build-up, and then the payoff is going to be super fast, and if you don't like it, then it's your problem. Yeah. Every single episode written by the guy. And Equestria Girls kind of carries that, despite him not being involved in the writing. But it is the same problem. You have this... Uh, this build up for this battle and then they all end up with the rainbow of friendship shooty laser beam attack boom it's so needlessly lazy that they could have gone so much better with that no but that, that is included on the on, on the sunset shimmer arc is that she's mean 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 then suddenly she puts on the crown and even though you see her crying and trying to like almost try to take it off 
because she's like, oh God, oh God, this was a bad idea. What was I thinking doing this? That's kind of rushed. That's kind of like, okay, you decided to change your mind on the last, literally the last second. At least they kind of like revert it back on Rainbow Rocks and they give her more of a character. Like she's not the redemptive one. She's trying to move away from that image. She has a reason to fight. She has a reason to stand. But in the first movie, she's basically the bully. She has no more personality than Beef Tannen in Back to the Future. And Beef Tannen was awesome. Well, let's save Rainbow Rock discussion at Rainbow Rocks because Sunset at Rainbow Rock is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now the mode of transportation that will travel to the alternate universe, the magical mirror. Always with the mirrors. It turns dragons into dogs. Does that mean that if they throw Winona out into the Equestria Girls world, she's going to turn into a giant behemoth? Is she going to turn into Smaug? I don't know. But... Okay, before we carry on, I just need to bring up a few scenes. Pinky and Luna's interaction. Cute. That's about it. Whatever Luna gives you an are you kidding me look. <laughs> yeah. You, you best pay attention, son. Mm-hmm. But they explain the mirror. Like, what was the mirror again? I, I kind of forgot. A uh, gateway to another it's world. It's an explanation that... that... <laughs> it only works on Go certain guys of the moon. It was held in Cantalot Castle, but they gave it to Kate. I, or I did a shtick asking the numerous questions. That came up for this. But the two big things that stand out is they say, well, this was Cadence's job to keep an eye on the mirror, and she didn't. Oh, and you did Cel- such a good job, Cadence. <laughs> and this is Celestia's former student, so Twilight, we need you to go and fix everything. <laughs> well, there's the Princess Summit. <laughs> the, the Princess Summit is who can we get to do the job for us? <laughs> Uh, okay, who's going to get stuck with the bill this time? Twilight, oh Twilight, Twilight. Uh, <laughs> All the princes are like, not it, not it, not it. <laughs> well, we kind of get why Twilight needs to head to the alternate universe, because if not who, right? Like, Celestia, come on. So Twilight is the chosen one to head into the alternate universe, and as per usual, her friends are excited, and well, let's go. And Celestia stops everyone because, hey, we got no idea what's on the other side. Because if we remember in the Reflections arc, Celestia remembers that if it's like the other mirror, thing can get a bit haywire and they got no idea what is on the other side. So it's best that they send one pony in so she can solve all the problems. And that one One pony is the princess and element of magic who we can't possibly afford to lose should anything bad happen. And it's not like there's an entire palace of guards right there. I'm sorry. Silver, silver, silver. There's no nitpicking, man. No nitpicking. Because if we nitpick, we go... What do you mean nitpicking? Just nitpicking, Norman. (laughs) Shut up. Silver, go ahead. Nitpick the... Yes to the nitpicking. This is... This is... This is not a nitpick. This is a glaring billboard. Oh, let's yeah. send, let's send the one irreplaceable pony into this realm with no okay. support. Thank, thank you, Spike, for being a true friend. Only Spike is willing to defy the princess's orders and stick by Twilight Sides. And that's, and I say again, this movie is Spike's shining moment. Mm. This is him at his most celebrated traits of loyalty, courage, and support. This uh, is intelligent. He's a smart guy as well. He's a smart guy. This is Spike at his best. It is after he became a dog, <laughs> which I find just fa- even diamond dogs are human in this world. <laughs> Spike, uh... Spike... <laughs> oh my god, you're right. <laughs> I forgot about that. They are human. What the hell? It makes no sense. Oh. So only, only Spike is reduced to a pet, and yet in this world, he is the best character. Everyone who watched Princess Spike needs to go see this to see Spike at his best. And that's all I've got to say on that. And I will nitpick when I choose, good sir. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe when you get on all fours, you start thinking differently or something. (laughs) Okay. But anyway, after Spike's defiant moment, we go to the other world. This strange new world. Ported through a very creepy animated sequence. Yep, yep, true. Unfortunately, this is not the new world of Street Fighter 3. So, what do we have here now? Like, Spike is a dog, and Twilight is... Uh, Twilight's a human. Oh. And every time you watch this, this is, this is as fittingly awkward as it should be. Yep. Uh, I mean, it, I, I personally like a lot the moment where Twilight just starts scalloping on all fours. 
<laughs> because she's the, she's the, she freaks out because her snout is too small. She's like, she's like, my muscle, what's wrong with my, ah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I always <laughs> found that so funny. It's like, yeah, that's so neat. And so disturbing at the same time. David Cronenberg is enjoying this part a lot. Notice one thing when she puts her hand into the mirror, it changes into a hoof. Yes, she puts the, the entire arm inside and it turns into a hoof with a... Uh. Mm. So, so is that hoof reaching back through the mirror in the Crystal Empire? And I was like, what is she doing? <laughs> uh, I tried to, do you need a high hoof? Do you need a hug? Uh, well, yeah, I'll, oh, imagine that, if they start pulling... <laughs> Yeah, that, that, then she could have her support group again. <laughs> true that, true that. But after this scene where Twilight gallops <laughs> in human form, she sees... Well, this is strange because we see a human with a dog and the dog looking at his master saying, I want that too. Actually, what's uh, he doing walking a dog on campus? That's my question. Get back to class, young man. That's the other thing. What? This is strange. That, that definitely, this is not the human world. They will not allow that. Pretty laissez-faire about rules. Mm. Looking at you, Principal Celestia. <laughs> oh God, can we talk? Can we talk about her when we reach her? Because holy cow, do we well, have to say things about Principal Celestia? Well, here's here's the thing. We get the moment with Fluttershy is like the next big thing, and it's and it's point for point Fluttershy's introduction from the show. Which I think works. It shows here's the similarities between the worlds. But after that, as they introduce all the other characters, now it's a new setting, a new spin. I do think that was a clever uh, style. Give her, give, let Fluttershy show the similarities. Let the others show the differences. I agree with that. And, bef- and before we jump to that scene, like we yeah, have to we remember... Are, this is a musical. And we are forgetting about it. No, no. Before we jump to that, right, there's one more important character we were missing. Like, he's the man. Like, Vincent Tong played this role awesomely, man. Okay. <laughs> oh, like, no. Are I'm, we... Are I'm we... we to... Isn't it a bit too early, Norman? No, not really. Shouldn't we give a bit more time to this? I'm not no, ready. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to sell this really hard, but I ain't selling it, am I? You are not. Do, do I this... don't want to talk about Fox You can right sell now. this... You can sell this at a yard sale, man. Uh, okay, Flash. You can give this for free with tickets to the moon. I will not take it. Well, Flash entry, well, the, the way they introduced each other was kind of cute. Like, uh, Flash helps Twilight up, as per usual. <laughs> hey, do you like corn dogs? Oh, wait a minute, wrong character. Uh, wrong scene, too. Here's the thing. I said this in my review, but I'll say it again. Flash's powers and charm are based on basic human decency. You see someone fall down, you help them up. It's the basic nice thing to do. Flash is an awesome guy because everyone else at Cantalot High is awful. Yeah, I mean, come on. He has a high charisma on his character chart, so that's good. Charisma? Everyone else is in the negative charisma. (laughs) He's like at one, and everyone else is negative 30. (laughs) Oh. It's like, that's like saying you're the strongest warrior in the tribe of wimps. <laughs> you're you're still a much. wimp. Yes. Uh, we're, we're being mean. It, 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 it is not, no, but it is true. It's not an achievement when everybody else around you sucks. Mm-hmm. Like for Flash okay, to, it, it isn't. Sorry, but for Flash to be a really good guy, he needs to be an active participant. And unfortunately, aside from the scene where he resolves things very quickly for Twilight, He's just not there. Mm-hmm. And the thing that frustrates me is not, oh, Twilight can't have a boyfriend. No. No, that's, that's silly. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to have this guy to have an important relationship with Twilight, he needs to be proactive. This is a proactive heroine. This is someone we cheer for. Having her just sort of settled with a token is as lame as any guy movie where the girl is just a bosomy blonde who, who's supposed to want to spend the night with him. That's lousy. Yes. Flash, sure. I don't know. I mean, if they were to flush his personality out, we could have gotten a really interesting, awesome character. But I don't know why they wanted to introduce him. If he's not in this movie, then there's nothing even wrong. Like, we won't be missing anything. Aside from the photo trick, which technically anyone could have... Yeah, could, I mean, that's the thing. Because... Flash as a character in this movie, awesome acting by Vincent Tong, but it doesn't really, how do I put this? What's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't really add anything to the movie. The whole thing with Luna was just to get that funny scene about 
Flash getting rejected. That's about it. We're getting a bit ahead of ourselves now. True that. Well, we're, we're covering Flash in a nutshell because really, if you tally up his screen time, I don't think he's even there for more than four minutes. Probably. Combining the entire movie, not really. He just crashes into into the movie every now and then, just to be like, hey, I'm in this movie, reminding everyone, I'm here, okay, bye. Mm-hmm. And then we're going back to Twilight and the, and the Human Five. But before that, and before we meet with Fluttershy, we don't have the, the one musical number, the first one in the entire film. And we're forgetting about that, is that this movie is a musical. But that's because most of the music is forgettable. It is very forgettable. It is not the kind of music that you remember when you watch the movie after you watch the movie only once. It's the kind of music that you remember because if you only have watched the movie a zillion times, like me. But yeah, it's uh, it, it 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 is it is a weird musical number to be honest. It's just Twilight being confused about everything that surrounds her. But still, it was a pretty good tune. It is a good tune, but it's kind of like. I'm reminded of that scene in Little Mermaid where Ariel is just walking around the human world and she's fascinated by everything. It's like they don't... I'm pretty sure they were going for something similar to that, but they don't capture the same magic that that scene had. So where do we go now? Meeting Fluttershy. Ah, okay. So we have well. Fluttershy after Twilight's heroic introduction or heroic save for Fluttershy. Heroic, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, heroic. You say heroic, I say doipy, but okay, you just say heroic. Go ahead. I, I, I'm trying to cut this movie it. some slack. <laughs> I'm trying to give this movie a positive outlook, am I? But yeah, after Twilight kind of saves Fluttershy from the evil, evil lady who is, I don't know, has bacon colored hair, has a sun <laughs> for shirt chest, and well, we can tell that she's the mean girl for this movie. She's the bully. And well. Are you a wizard? <laughs> and, well, Twilight. Who goes could that be? Twilight saves Fluttershy, and the whole thing is really deja vu. It's hilarious the fact that Sunset Shimmer doesn't recognize Twilight Sparkle right away. <laughs> oh, wow. Like, she has her cutie mark on the dress and everything, and you don't recognize her. Sunset, you suck. I don't think Twilight recognizes Sunset either, so... That Twilight, hair you suck like too. Bacon. Great. It smells Thanks. like bacon, ketchup, and yeah. mustard. I'm hungry now. Thank- <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Norman. Now whenever I look at Sunset, I'll just think, oh, there's the bacon character. <laughs> well, that's always the thing. People have been calling her bacon hair. Hey, uh, the the names no. we come up with. But here's okay. I I already said my thoughts on the reenactments. But there is one thing: the flashback where Fluttershy is trying to hand out flyers, and then she curls into a ball and starts to cry. Ah, well, ah. <laughs> oh well. Allow me to be the cynical guy here saying, and then the executive board is like, seen to make people feel sorry for Fluttershy, check. <laughs> hey, hey, they hey, got hey, you. Hey. They got you. They got your money right there. Now you're going to go to the store and buy an Equestria Girls doll. Maybe you guys won't, but no. the other eight guys are going to. Hey, come on. Like, as, as Fluttershy fans, this is heartbreaking to see because she's trying her best to help. But nobody's really paying attention. Yeah, and then they throw they throw the crown at her. Later on, they're <laughs> gonna throw a, a broom at her face as well. Oh, like, poor yeah, Fluttershy. Fluttershy is the bad monkey of the of the movie. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's true. But now I don't know, Silver. Why do you think they do this? Well, to be honest, it's to, I think it's to show how much Fluttershy is suffering without her core support. That she's drifted apart from all her friends. And she's feeling pretty miserable. That comes across very clearly. You know, she seems in far greater spirits after she's reunited with everyone. But to be honest, and want to get into this later, they really could have expanded on this to have an even better conflict throughout the movie. But I guess I don't want to spoil that before we get to the actual competition. But basically, it's to show that not not all is well at, at the high school beyond... Twilight's awkwardness. I don't want to get to the next scene, honestly, because this is this is one of those moments where I am like, oh god, why? Because it's where we meet Principal Principal Celestia. Yes. Yes. And the- everything is everything is wrong with the, with this scene. Everything, absolutely everything. <laughs> Including her her appearance, good gravy. The, des- the, the, the design on the characters is, you know what, for humans and based on the MLP design and, and all that has to be stylized, has to look like the dolls. They didn't do a very bad job. I'll say that Fluttershy is the one that looks the best. But good God, what did they do with Luna and Celestia? They completely destroyed the character. 
In both of them. I think that she looks better in the third movies. All the shots I've seen, they look better in the third rendition. But this one was kind of an experimental phase, if you know what I mean. No, she has Ursula lips, the legs of Bayonetta, and the <laughs> likability of a lamppost. I mean, what does Celestia have in this scene that makes me care for her or anything that she does? Nothing. And pants. That's yeah. the weird thing. Every, all the girls in this wear skirts. And I thought, okay, is this a, a flash animation technique? Is it easier to animate if there's a skirt blocking the, the hip joints? No, not really. Uh, and that, but then there's Celestia and Luna. Are pants for grown women? And skirts are for little girls? What? She wears the pants in this high school. Yeah, the more <laughs> we don't question, the more we can go carry on with this movie review. So, well, the, well, I'll just say this then, when you talk about wearing the pants in the school. Celestia makes the announcements, but it's always Luna who's handling the discipline and the mechanics of the school. What does Principal Celestia do? Look I mean, pretty she, and pose for calendars. When she writes that big X on the board, and you, you can't write... I think, well, someone just got fired. <laughs> uh, oh, well. M.A. Larson, you're out of the building. So, and here's the part where we get the plot of the story. Twilight needs to become popular so she can win the crown. Why didn't they turn this into an Ocean's Eleven type of heist movie where <laughs> instead of becoming popular, Twilight gathers the main, the human five to go get the crown, but then they encounter the team of <laughs> the thieves that <laughs> Sansa Shimmer has put together. I'm just making my own move in my head right now. <laughs> it, that, that would have been more interesting. I mean, get around. Celestia, Principal Celestia, is more a blockade to solution than part of this cause. For all the times I have called out Princess Celestia on bad planning, and I do stand by that, she at least was trying to offer a solution. Or to offer caution, Principal Celestia is just a roadblock. Principal Celestia here is just like any other school person. She just wants to get her job done and go home. That's unfortunate. But can we kind of abridge Twilight's quest and meeting all the friends? Because we're going to be here. Yep, another, yep, yep. Another, another oh, yeah, hour. yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's fast let's forward. Just glo- let's just gloss let's over it. We're going to... Yeah, let's press the fast forward button right now because okay, this maybe. is as uneventful as we can yeah. imagine. She meets Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie is as cookie as the Equestria Girls. And then uh, we meet Applejack. Applejack is apple as ever. And we also meet Big Pie at the same time. Yay! And at the same time, too, we also meet the bully, Sunset Shimmer and Snip and Snails. Who knew? I will say this. Snips and Snails are idiots. They are mm-hmm. intended to be so. That's their role in the show. I'm not crazy about them as characters, but I get the role they serve. They've never been bullies. And to see them suddenly stooges to a bully, I just kind of wonder, why why did you choose these characters? Why not make two lackeys out of the blue? Well, it's just easier that way. It's just easier that way. They're the Bok and Skulls. You know, they're bullies at first, but then became heroes. No, but heroes. Book and Skull, they were likable, and they had a moment of being heroic in a couple of episodes. You cannot compare Snips and Snails to Book and Skull, no, though. The first few Power Rangers scene, like, the first few. Yeah, okay, screw that. What they do with the cell phones and all that, and the subsequent uh, scene where they have Twilight uh, uh, being ridiculed in YouTube, uh-huh. not only does it open a very glaring big plot hole that is going to appear later on, but... Mm-hmm. Good grief, is it, is it like kind of out of character for these two guys? It's like, they have never been mean, they have been, Id- like what Silver just said, they have been idiots, but they have never been ill-intentioned or evil. This is on the level of, this is, I, don't, I cannot even imagine Beef Tannen doing something like this. And I know I keep going to Beef Tannen, but I, I'm in a Back to the Future mood lately. Give me, uh, can, can well, me some slack. But here's the thing, here's the thing, they're alternate universe characters, so the showrunners have that as an excuse. But anyway, we move on to the next character that we are going to be kind of having a deja vu is Trixie. But Trixie is not part of the main six. When are we going to talk about when she meets with, with ra ra ra? I know, but it's just Trixie. Come on, it's Trixie. But here's the thing, Norman. You say that they're alternate worlds so they can be different. But the, this movie does a lot to say, see, these characters are so much like their pony counterparts. Yeah, but so, the thing so, is, like, I'm also in the mindset of the influence because 
with Snape and Snails, they didn't have any anyone influencing them to be bad. Oh, with... come on, Trixie and Trixie, Trixie no, much? Come on. Trixie is just them idolizing her. But with this one, it's just Sunset's manipulating Snape and Snails. So there's that. I don't even know if she's manipulating. She just says, go do this. Like, okay. Yeah, I mean, but still, like, she's manipulating them so they do her dirty work. And, well, if they don't do it, well, bad things are going to happen. Uh, this is what happens when the showrunners have a limitation to characters that they can use. I mean, what other char- characters can you think in the show that are bullies that you could use? I mean, you can think, you could think Damian Tiar and Silverspoon. Yeah, but, in this kind of movie, you cannot put two female characters at the control of another female character. It's more fitting to have two male characters under the control of a female character. Because then it's okay to ridicule, because then it's okay to ridicule them, it's okay to make fun of them. Not in the next movie. Which is why I really, uh, don't consider MLP to be a feminist message. If that's, I don't consider, yeah. If that's feminism, I can't give it my support. I don't consider it feminism at all. But I will say, I wish they'd just come up with two extra characters. It's not like Snips and Snails have any deep character development themselves. Mm-hmm. No, no, and they introduce Sunset Shimmer. Why not introduce them two other characters? In the next movie, they will introduce three characters that we know nothing about. <laughs> and one of them became a fandom darling. So why wouldn't they introduce two new characters that we can do just whatever we want with them? We can dance if we want to. We can leave Snips and Snails behind. Mm. Oh, yeah, and let's go to the next day. Yeah, no, not to the next day. There is one thing that we should talk about at least briefly is that uh, Cheerley is a disgruntled teacher slash librarian and the main, the, the, the Kitty Mark Crusaders are YouTubers. <laughs> but you got something against YouTubers there? Hey? Mm, hey? Mm, mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I kind of find it amusing that they are using YouTube. Out of all things, they are using YouTube. Hey, Twitch oh. wasn't popular then. And they could have used Blip, but wow, that would be awkward now. Wow. Oh, oh, that would be really awkward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So oh, anyway. But it's nice <laughs> that I'm reading the, the comments section. It's like, girls, if you think that's harsh on YouTube, just wait. Oh. Wait, and wait until some homophobic, homophobic 10 year old. <laughs> homophobic. Uh, starts. <laughs> People who hate homos? How dare they? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Homo- guys, guys. Homophobic 10 year old spewing racial slurs in the YouTube oh, comments. Alright, guys, guys, guys. We carry on to the next scene where Twilight just discovers the yearbook. And they see that the rest of them are friends. Yay. And then we find out why. You're like, what? I'm guessing this is this, this is the plot hole that James was referring to. That they all have cell phones. They could all easily validate what happened. That just with a little bit of communication, they could have undone Sunset Shimmer's sabotage. Say that three times fast. Good luck. If they did a little bit of cross information, is like, hey, did you send me this? No, I didn't send you this. It's like, no, they just assumed that they were being mean to each other and they stopped talking. It's like, what kind of friendship is this? Well, I don't know how to say this. This 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 kind of trope bothers me a bit. It happens a lot, like even in The Legend of Korra and some of the shows. This whole thing can be easily resolved if you just talk. It's like in any show. Like, you, you know that one scene where if a guy and a girl are in a swing room doing something or are in a very awkward situation and someone comes in and they automatically assume... That they're doing something, but actually it just, the guy just trip on the girl or vice versa. If they just talk or just say something, it'll all be resolved. But hey, this is one of the ways that they wanted to get the main five separated. So yeah, it worked, I guess. And Twilight is a blonde now. Oh, yes. But she's a smart blonde. Oh, stereotyping. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, she's more Tara Strong than Tara Strong. Haha. <laughs> 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 but she, uh, they, they reconcile really quick. I mean, it takes Twilight all of five minutes to get the, to get this grudge match to come apart. And in the meantime, the movie is looking on the dictionary, the definition of the word conflict, and it's not finding anything because conflict is not in the dictionary of the movie. <laughs> After we get introduced to Rarity and all the rest of the girls cross referencing their phone saying, did you be mean to me or not? They all kiss and make up and we go to the, Pitch. Whoa, whoa, and... they all, they all kid. What scene, what scene were you watching, sir? It's I mean, just a, it's just a human phrase. Are you, no, uh, no, no, no. 
This is the Equestria Girls rated R version. Come on, yeah, no. Norman, how do you make yourself with a copy of that and can I get one? No, you guys. Anyway, you are kind of, could... You're kind of glossing over one of the major scenes is when they go meet with Rainbow Dash. I'm and... trying to get there. Well, I get, the... I'm getting there already. And then uh, that's where Rainbow Dash and Applejack uh, kiss and make out. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is some Apple <laughs> Dash in there. Oh, wow. And chicken bow wow. But anyway, um, Rainbow Dash challenges Twilight to a football match, which kind of is unfair, given Twilight's track record of being on two legs for a few days now. And, well, the total goal is 5-0. I did love Rarity's line. I thought you were going to turn it around there. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's all good. I mean, it shows Rainbow Dash is loyal, still in her own way. I think the thing is with that, scene was Rainbow Dash just wanted to see if Twilight is the kind of character that she can stick behind and well I guess so I think we're at another part where we could just sort of fast forward they go to this shake shop and the two big things that come out of it is ooh Flash Sentry dated Sunset Shimmer this will go this will go nowhere nowhere and with the earworm yep yeah yes this is the best this is the best Okay, we're and, gonna and, put Norman in the cage, and then we're gonna just talk like rational people, shall we, Silver? Oh dear, I don't know if I can be rational about this. This is this is very much an emotional reaction. This one hit wonder. Hey, hey, so- hi, <laughs> everybody. Hey, shut up, Norman. <laughs> this, this one song is supposed to unite the entire school in friendship and overcome their boundaries. It's like really. Why yes. <laughs> Why did the sirens and sunset shimmer need to rely on mind control? All you have to do is say, hey, hey, go invade Equestria, <laughs> and these kids would dance into the portal. <laughs> Fluttershy hypnotizing hamsters was more difficult than getting these idiots to follow along. I honestly wonder what would have happened if they, instead of using that, they would have used another song like, I don't know, the Gangnam Style. <laughs> Hey, this is this is well, safety. That's <laughs> later in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, but hey, uh, yeah. After okay. We, <laughs> after this, like after uh, this earworm of a song, we get to see that Sunset Shimmer's sabotaging all of Pinkie Pie's hard work and blaming it on Twilight. And somehow, Flash Sentry is the hero for this. The hero for this, but then. Here's the thing. What was Sunset's plan? Because she says, oh, I'm going to frame Twilight. And then after Flash undoes her uh, scam, she's mad at Snips and Snails for trashing the place so well. It's like, I need this thing to go on. Then why did you sabotage it? Sunset Shimmer makes less sense than the villains in Captain Planet. It's like, I'm going to steal this oil tanker and then I'm going to crash it in the beach. (laughs) Haha, that will teach those dolphins. Like, why don't you sell it on the black market and make a fortune? You are such an idiot. The thing with this is that the other plot hole that I I think comes from the use of cell phones is like, you have access to cell phones, video editing software, and then you decide to edit the photos with, like, paper, uh, scissors and glue. <laughs> there is this one thing called Photoshop, you know? I am kind of using it right now as we are recording this review and everything. I can do magic with this. I can literally time travel and put myself in a photo next to Winston Churchill. <laughs> Why do you think you need to use the scissors and the glue? This is so stupid! And, of course, the reason why Flash Sentry is able to save the day is because both Snips and Snails and Sunset Shimmer, they are idiots! And so is Princess Luna. Can you not tell that the photos have been glued over? No, that's a good picture of Photoshop, man. That's a good picture. It's not Photoshop! (laughs) It's not Photoshop! (laughs) I know it's not Photoshop. I can tell by the pixels. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, but anyway, we move on to the scene where Twilight needs to get a new dress. Yes. Well, well, first she needs to despair, and this is where Spike shines, because he, he gives her the push she needs to to tell them the truth, and then Pinky's fourth wall just steals all the tension. This is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. <laughs> there are two scenes in the movie that I genuinely like. This is one of them. I adore the way that it's done, and the way that it is paced. is like, okay, here we go. They're not going to believe her. They're going to go, oh, we're going to waste some time here. And Pinky is like straight to the point, 
And Rainbow Dash is like, yeah, I even think that's the reason. And Spikes is just like, no, she literally, she's, she's, she's really spot on. And they all go, ah, a dog, a dog that can talk. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh, Fluttershy, Fluttershy's face, like, <laughs> awesome. I like that. I, I, th- I thought that was absolutely hilarious. I was like, yes, good. Yeah, but Fluttershy's face in this scene is like, <laughs> but it, it, it's funny. But I think, narratively speaking, it's a complete Oh, t- to- totally, <laughs> totally. But you know what? It does solve the problem of, how do I explain this to my friends? Oh my god, they're not going to believe me. They're only going to have so much drama. I think a talking dog is pretty good validation. Yeah, true, but hey, at least we got the Fluttershy face. I have a question for you. When, um, when Twilight gets in the, in the, um, clothes changer and, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, where, where you change clothes and all that, and she looks in the mirror, were you also weirded out when you see the pony reflection on it? Because I was like, oh, God, Ed, you're right. I got used to the Quester Girls design. Did, did it happen to you guys as well? Uh, not really. I, I, I haven't seen this one in a while. I may need to double check, but I do understand what you mean. Because a lot of people, when they first saw the ponies, they were all happy. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to have ponies in a movie. And then suddenly we changed to the human. And they're like, oh, no, what is this? As time goes on and a very catchy song... And to have this appear again, it's something like, oh my god, what, what am I seeing? I, I felt a little weirded out, just because of the juxtaposition. Ponies are actually have some, you know, they're a little pudgy, a little bit more proportional, still have big heads and whatever. But next to this stick figure of an equestrian girl, you're just like, ah. But anyway, let's not dilly-dally and move on to the scene where everybody helps clean the gym. That's really all you need to say. Everyone helps clean the gym. And then, I guess it's a nice contrast to how it started when no one would help Twilight get off the floor. Now they're all coming together. But again, it's such an easy, quick fix that it feels like nothing's been earned. The the script gave you this freebie. Yeah, but hey, we're almost near the end. After we get dressed and Pinkie Pie looking too emo, we get... eh? We got a nice scene. Everybody's in there. Nice. Oh, I'm, I'm lying if I say nice dress. It's just okay. And everyone goes to the gym to party. Before that, we get to see Flash riding in his really cool car. That could be a Transformer. He's riding a Bumblebee from the Transformer. That is a Camaro, isn't it? I don't know. Looks like a Camaro. The only person in this move, in this universe, who drives a transformer is Vinyl Scratch. We know this. Oh, true that. True oh, that, that is true. Oh my God, I cannot wait to talk about her on the Rainbow Rocks movie. Uh... Yeah, yeah. But uh, I do want to say the scene with Flash. Mm-hmm. This was the scene that made me give up on Flash ever becoming a <laughs> character in its own right. Because here's the thing: thanks to a miscommunication, granted it was a misunderstanding, but he thinks Twilight has said no to him three times. In rapid succession. He's been turned down for a date at the prom. Now most guys, as far as I know, would be depressed, kind of frustrated, but they wouldn't want to go to a prom alone. They did go with someone. It might have been interesting if Flash had gone with uh gone back to Sunset Shimmer on the rebound. Mm-hmm. Instead, this is how whips his character is. He goes to the prom and hoping that the one girl will Take him back if he asks just one more time. Ladies, for those of you listening, I can promise you, a guy's not going to do that on prom night. If you want to go with him, let him know because guys can be kind of dense, but they're not going to crawl back for a second chance. So I just say, this is where I realized Flash really is just there to be Twilight's love interest. He has no identity. And then I'm looking on uh, on the pony wiki, and the screenshot, just after he walks into the door, mm-hmm. as he dashes in after Twilight, he's looking back at the audience with his smile. It's like, yeah. It's like, wow, he really is trying to be a wife <laughs> stealer. Because he's grinning at the audience saying, see ya, suckas. <laughs> I got to talk to the wife who's stealing myself. <laughs> it's just, I just look at that post. It's like, why would they drop that? <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? So after dancing and tallying the votes, obviously the winner is Twilight Sparkle. And, well, after that scene, we get to see Spike getting kidnapped or dog-napped. 
And we discovered that Sunset is giving Twilight an ultimatum. Give the crown or I'll break the mirror. Can I just say this is where I kind of wish Sunset had had an alternate plan. Which was? Well, I mentioned earlier that with Fluttershy, they set something up. They set up how, how lonely and rejected she was. More than any other the main human five, mm-hmm. They saw we saw her struggling. And it's pretty clear Sunset's always won because she's intimidated everyone else into submission. You know, no contest, Victor. What if instead of trying to put herself in there, she tried to set Fluttershy up as the prom queen, throw her support between a puppet, behind a puppet, who is seduced by the idea of being popular for a change? You know, that could have worked, but I believe that it would have been more beneficial if it was Rainbow Dash. Play to her ego, you know what I mean? There's ego and then there's desperation, which is why I think Fluttershy is the better victim here. And how hard for Twilight to now have to run against the first friend she made at Canterlot. And son of a gun, Fluttershy wins, but has to give the crown to Sunset, and that's how Sunset gets the crown upon her head. But Twilight forgives Fluttershy, they reconcile, the the circle of friends is reunited, our, or pony up, whatever, comes into play. I just feel like that would have been a stronger piece. And I feel like it would have shown through had the staff been given more time or perhaps, I, I don't know, cared more. I don't know the, the politics or the, or the production history that went into this, but I get the yeah. sense that everything was rushed. Probably. I, I got that feeling too. And you know what? Here, here's something where I'm a bit blur or I'm a bit confused with the sledgehammer scene. <laughs> Can I say just for a moment that I am so glad that she's using a sledgehammer in this moment? Why? Yeah, because I am like, yeah, this is what... Sunset Shimmer is not fooling around anymore. I mean, screw the dancing, the singing, the looking cute, the framing, no, 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 no. What is my sledgehammer? <laughs> so it's time to play the game? Have you seen Misery? I'm going to go Misery on this portal if you don't give me what I want. I like that very no-nonsense kind of action. In that moment, I'm kind of like siding with Sunset Shimmer, actually. If only, if anything, because she has a clear goal. Like, right now, Twilight has no motivation to still be in the, being there. She has Spike, she has the crown, she has everything. Mm, she All she needs home. to do is just, just, uh, now that Sunset Shimmer has dropped the, the, the hammer after that, <laughs> she could just run through the portal and then it's over. F- bye. No need for fight, no need for nothing. Here's the thing, like, we all know that the portal is activated. Anything goes through it goes to the other side. So, if Sunset swings the sledgehammer... Nah, you know, I subscribe to what Silver said on his review. She's aiming for the structure where the the, the portal is. But my other thing is, if the portal does encompass the whole statue, which I don't think it does, you didn't wind up with one heavily concussed Celestia. (laughs) At least that would be drama. That would be... Something. Then Celestia comes through the portal, and then it's no nonsense. Yo, you did someone lose this? I'd like to return it. Oh, <laughs> uh, now it's really time to play the game. Although that that is an interesting idea. However, Twilight could fake giving in and then just dash into the portal. At which point, Sunset's completely foiled. I don't understand when Twilight says, "Oh, I can't leave you to wreak havoc in this world." He's been a bully at a school. What? She's going to go for president and launch nuclear winter? Who knows? Twilight's justification, good for her for not just letting Sunset dictate the terms of this conflict. But you're smarter than this. And plus, as we've all established, Equestria really is up a creek without Twilight. True that, true that. And, well, not to linger on, we go to the scene where Sunset gets the crown and turns into a she-demon. Literally. Actually, there's a funny comment someone made on my video. Why do we call them she-demons? Why not just demons? Well, it is a she. It is a she, but, but demon we never call them neutral. Yeah, we never call them he-demons. Well, I... No comment. That I don't know. I, I'm just trying to it's get like, this... You know, that's that's that happens as well. It's like on, on the Lord of the Ring movies. Like, they call one of the characters a she-elf. It's like, what? Are the, the other elves are he-elves? <laughs> Is it, this is, re- so is Legolas a he elf? Is that, this is so stupid. No, I don't like that. I am, I'm with Silver on this one. D- d- why calling it a she demon? Well, no. no need to call her a she well, demon. Now, well, no, I, I called her a she demon as well, so I'm not, I, I'm just used to that term. 
But then someone asks, and you're like, huh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Why do we call them she-demons? As if somehow we need to further explain what, what this is. This is really cool, demon, because she's a she-demon. She has boobies. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. Does she? I thought that the Grizzly Girls models are kind of like, you know, flat. <laughs> carry on, carry on. We we do see that, well, Sunset is very evil in terms of she throws a fiery blast of energy ball towards the main six. Uh, why does this three character remind me of a very evil Dragon Ball character? Which one? Pick one. They all fire balls of energy at children. I know, pick uh, one. This is the persona part of the of the movie. <laughs> well, I do want to say oh. the tears, the tears that Sunset shed. Why is it that every line I try to put Sunset Shimmer in has an S rhythm to it? It's very hard to speak. No, I uh, don't know. Uh, those tears where she's putting on that, I've often wondered, is that supposed to have a deeper meaning? That she didn't realize this would happen and she's scared. Some part of her is being distorted and amplified. I, uh, is all this coming to a head? I, and it, and after the Deus Ex Rainbow, you have to wonder. I, I wonder, is that what what coaxes her to realize she's been making so many mistakes? I guess so. I mean, right now, if we just take a look, see, and just try to think hard, why is she crying? Is it painful? Well, what? if you notice, before she puts on the crown, she kind of like, uh, after she puts on the crown, there is like a split second where you can see her face, and her face has the biggest, ouch, what did I do? What did I do that for? Ah, you have to take it off, take it off, take it off. But <laughs> she she can, and now like the, the crown has taken control of her, but because she's evil, it's transforming her into something. Yeah. Why wasn't it transforming Twilight? This is so weird. Well, I'm, I don't know, because if we just linger on and ask why, we, we won't be finished. And we're almost at the end, guys. Yeah, we're so, almost at the end. So, we're almost at the end. The end is in sight. Hold on, brothers. I believe we can do this. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, I'll So, um, the, the uh, to, uh, Sunset Shimmer as a demon attacks to Twilight and the, the, the human five, but the friendship that they have built between each other protects them as a shield. Lame, lame, lame. They transform into their marketable toy equestrian girls kind of designs, uh, which it's kind of a waste of a design. They turn into, uh, uh they, they summon the rainbow of light to uh, destroy the demon that, that Sunset Shimmer turned into. The crown the get, loses its powers and Santa Shimmer becomes back to normal. Yeah, and the dance continues on. So basically, Nightmare Moon 2.0. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, without uh, you know, without the engagement, the engaging or likability or fun or anything. <laughs> I'm being mean now. I'm being mean. And and then Principal <laughs> Celestia gives a lecture on being a leader when she herself <laughs> is a. Whole- is a horrible lead. I will harp on this till the end of, of friendship games. Principal Celestia mm. has no charisma, knowledge, or guidance. She is the opposite of Princess Celestia. Oh, uh, well, no comment there, my friend. No comment there, my friend. But Many comments uh, here. I agree. She has the same amount of charisma, like you said before, as a lamppost. She has <laughs> nothing. Like, you will be better following, I don't know. Iron will. God, I, it's just, you know those, uh, those 90s and 80s high school movies where the director, the principal is just, uh, a, a placeholder and he's there just to, you know, be a, a blockade. Like you said before, she's worse than that because she's not even funny. Those characters were funny. She's not funny. I don't know, man. Like, she's just there just to be there, like the principal figure, like any, I don't know. Let's carry on to the next scene. We're dancing! Dancing, dancing, dancing. Yay! Even in human form, Twilight can't dance. She's and dancing yet, like a horse. <laughs> she dances like a horse, and I maintain, based on that face, poor Flash Sentry pulled a groin muscle. <laughs> oh, wow. He, oh. he was limping through Canterlot High the next day going, Earl, oh, Earl. Oh. Oh, here's the thing with Flash. Mm-hmm. The other thing, one of many things, it seems. This will be true when we talk about Rainbow Rocks as well. Flash has no concept of capturing the moment. He has nearly gotten a kiss, but never been able to, you know, earn it. 
and and the thing is, he just sort of says goodbye to Twilight for the night, so she can go dash off into the into the um, statue. It's like Flash, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Why are you why are you going away? This is supposed to be romantic. Make this moment mean something. Uh, but anyway, we see Twilight saying goodbye to the rest and telling the other five to well treat Sunset as a friend and be good to her and teach her the ways of friendship. And we also learned that Cantalot High's budget is awful because they're having students do masonry work. <laughs> uh, it's punishment, yo. It's punishment. Punishment. It's punishment. punishment. That's, that's clearing away the rubble. You don't pay them for a construction job. Although I will say this. Given how Cantalot High looks in the next movie, Sunset did an amazing job. That girl got the wrong cutie mark. Her, her talent lies in construction. <laughs> well, her cutie mark should be a brick. <laughs> Maybe that's uh, why he was using the sledgehammer. She has a secret thing for building things. Oh, wow. And that's that's why her villainous character arc is a brick. <laughs> here's here's one thing I need to point out to you guys. Like this is the last day of the portal being open, and Pinkie Pie is running through the. Oh, well, she didn't get through it, but she just runs through the portal. And what makes her think this is a good idea? She's not thinking. I think she just wants to be with her friend one more hug. Because Twilight insisted on staying for a dance and had that, that little sigh or deep breath before going through, she just barely made it. And it's like, you know, it's one thing to barely make it when the villain has pushed you to the limit. It's another thing to barely make it when you're just being irresponsible. <laughs> well, well, at least we know that she's on the other side. We, we know she's on the other side now. And well, with that, Princess Celestia asks Twilight how Sunset Shimmer doing and Twilight says she left her in good hands, and everybody asks what's hands. <laughs> Even though they've they've had giant foam hands in Equestria. Uh, and they have used the, the, the sentence hands several times. In fact, Rainbow Dash, who's the one who's saying it, she must have read the word hands a few times on the Derindu books, yeah. because there is a villain that has three hands in the... Oh. <laughs> no, come on, let, let, let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not. And... Oh, no, oh let's, come let's, on, let's, give let's, in to... let's. Here's the thing with nitpicks, with right. little things. Little things stand out more when the story fails to distract you to or to engage you. We're so not invested in the world of Equestria Girls that all the little things stand out more. Our attention is wavering and we're seeking something to fixate on. And lo and behold, here's all these little things that we can look at and really focus on. So unfortunately... To quote the nostalgia critic, don't be mad that you can see the strings on the puppet. Be mad that you're even looking for them. <laughs> True. I, am exact, I was exactly thinking on that video. You quoted it perfectly. I was going to quote it, but I'm sure I was going to make a terrible job, a job at it. Look, Norman, when it, when it comes to Need Peek and everything, uh, the same as Silver said, you're, have you guys watched the movie Aliens? Aliens? Oh, yes. Part 2? Aliens. Yeah, the second, the, the sequel All to right. the first Alien movie directed by James Cameron. Mm-hmm. That movie does have a few errors here and there. Like you can see the cables, the wires in some in some shots. You can tell when sometimes the the the, the alien is a model or a puppet, or when it's not really there, or when it's a retro projection or whatever. But if like you don't really notice those those nitpicks, or you don't take notice of them right away. Because you're so enthralled on the story and you care about the characters and the, the, the conflict of Ripley dealing with the, uh, with her past and her post-traumatic stress disorder is so well done. And uh, the acting is brilliant and the, the pacing is fantastic. It's like, it's, it has so many good things that you don't notice the mistakes. This is different. The, the Equestria Girls universe doesn't have enough to hold our interest, at least when it comes to me and Silver, apparently. Well, I don't mind it that much. But anyway, I'm trying to push along since we are an hour and a half in and we're near the end. So let's end this, boys. This was something that needed to be discussed, but it's also something that needs to be gotten through. Equestria Girls is, I guess we're kind of entering final thoughts now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have final thoughts. So let's go to final thoughts. Equestria Girls is ultimately harmless. No damage is done to Twilight's character. Granted, no one comes out looking particularly smart except for Spike, but no one, no one is like, oh, how could you? Why would you? But not how could you? But in terms of investment to come back, it's like, 
okay, it happened. It was a thing. I'm really not eager to see more of the Equestria Girls world. Now, we will. We saw Rainbow Rocks. We'll see Friendship Games. It's actually gotten better in my eyes. But at the end of this movie, I was like, you know what? Take it or leave it. I'd really just leave it. Yeah, it's something that I can actually survive without. I need to get my pony fix by watching Rain, uh, by watching Equestrian Girls. Uh, but, because remember how I said at the beginning of this review that I like this movie? Yeah. <laughs> that I watched it I, a lot. I think what you could watch it, and you can actually have fun with how awful it is. But when you really want to talk about plot and story and all that good stuff, yeah, that's not going to happen. Oh, mm-hmm. no, it, it definitely is. And it's like, um, it, it, it's... It is, it is stupid. It is kind of senseless. It doesn't make, uh, it doesn't gel together within the My Little Pony universe. It doesn't work at all. Uh, and the characters more than ever are like cutouts. But that doesn't mean I cannot enjoy it. Uh, I, I watched this movie more than a hundred times and I watched it another hundred times more because the, 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 the review value, the, the rewatch value to me is high on this one. Like, it, it, like I said at the beginning, it's so terrible. It's like watching a train wreck inside a clown circus. But that's because it is so much fun. Hmm. It, 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 it is fun. I can just sit back, watch it, and just forget about everything. It's, it's a turn your brain off and just watch it. I like the music. I like the voice acting, despite having a few flukes here and there. And I like those two scenes. Besides that, I I don't think uh, it has m- much more going for it. Well, as for me, this movie is... Well, it's a take-it-or-leave-it kind of situation. It doesn't hurt the show, but it doesn't kind of excel at it or move it on in terms of canonization. We do get a new character out of it, which is Sunset, so that's a plus there. But other than that... It's kind of a harmless movie. It doesn't really disturb with the mainline canon. It doesn't really harm the characters. It's it's just a movie. It's just something to be watched and I, I would say admire, but it's just something to be entertained by. Other than that, nothing much. It's it's a fun movie. It's a fun watch. Like James said, it's turn off your brain and just have fun with it. I did want to comment on the, the turn off your brain thing because, uh, granted, I watched, you know, The Expendables and oh, yeah. a- any number of movies where you just, it's almost inviting you to just say, don't take this too seriously. It's just meant to be violence and absurdity and you can just delight in that. And there, there are plenty of movies I've watched that have asked that of its audience and I've said, sure. This one asked me to, to be invested in these characters. And I was like, I'm sorry, but you're not giving me enough to work with. I can't turn off my brain for this one. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I, I I never really asked too many questions out of it. Like, I just watched it and had fun. There's nothing wrong with that, really. But, James, you have your final thoughts? My final thoughts is that I think after saying all of this that I said about, oh, yeah, I watched it another 100 times, I think I think that was a bit exaggerating. I exaggerated a little bit. I think I might not be able to watch it more than, like, twice or three times. Are you sure? But, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but I... I, I Subscribe to what I, I sometimes I feel like I am just kissing up to silver when I'm talking about <laughs> movies on, or episodes on on all that. But I agree with the the way that he put it in his video is that this is not really a movie that aims to a particular part of the fandom or anything. This can still be seen by uh, by little children and it will not hurt them or it will not make the parents concerned or anything like. It's not going to make the kids go up on a rooftop and start <laughs> shooting lasers with their super soaker and try to fly. I'm not speaking from personal experience or anything. Shut up. Uh, it's, it's, the thing is that, uh, <laughs> the thing is that I, I like that the, the way the movie works is that it's not going to give you anything, but it's not going to take anything away. Or if it's going to give you anything, at least it's going to keep the kids entertained for like an hour and a half or yeah, less. True, so yeah. it did give us one thing. Sounds like it your gave mind. two things. It gave us flash century drama, which yes. is if you, if you can enjoy the ride, it's actually funny to see how much of a visceral reaction Flash uh, oh, evokes in God. people. It's, you just watch it, and it's like, come on, Grandpa's watching his stories. <laughs> you you know what? Okay, you you know what? B- before you talk about sunset, uh, recently at a local con called uh, the Friendship Express, they got 
a Skype conference with Vincent Tong, who is the voice of uh, Flash Century, uh, Hoity Toity, and the Dragon, the bully one, and um, who else? Chip Donut Joe. Wow. And, yeah. And Holy he, cow! I didn't know that he voices Hoity Toity. Ah, <laughs> my brain! Oh no! Why did so, you do this to me, Norman? Norman. Ah. Because I can. But anyway, the thing is, when when we were in line asking him questions, someone kind of took it a step too far. I don't know if it's a step too far, in my opinion, but someone asked him about the whole Flash Century Twilight thing, because uh, it's cringeworthy, but it it had that it still had that reaction after three years now, was it? So, I, I don't know how, but Flash Sentry here is still a hot button character. Like, uh. I was uh, uh, kind of hoping you'd flub and say hot character. It's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> he is I didn't hot. know that you had a Flash Sentry fetish. Mm-hmm. No, no, my fetish is for sunset. Now I know what to get you for pre- for your present next birthday. Uh, uh-huh. Sunset, 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 please. Right in now, okay, Norman wants a uh, Flash <laughs> Takimakura. Uh, Takimakura, yes, Takimakura, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But anyway, uh, besides that, we got Sunset, yay. But that became more meaningful in the next movie. Yeah, true that. Yeah, that beca- yeah which we are going to talk about next week. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, well, that's about it for this one. Mm-hmm. Well, so, shall we talk about what we're going to talk about next week? <laughs> oh, I wonder what. <laughs> We're going to talk about a movie that aimed a little higher and hit the mark. I think. Yeah. <laughs> a little happy. And also brings up a lot of more questions. <laughs> we are going to talk about, of course, Equestria Girls Rainbow Rocks, which is the sequel to the first Equestria Girls movie. But that will be a story for another time. This has been Jim Cork. And I am Roman Sanzo. And I have survived high school. <laughs> hey, hey, everybody. Shut up, Norman. <laughs> See you guys on the next MBS Show Reviews. Bye. Uh, bye-bye. Adios. <laughs>